Let's take our Bibles and turn to the book of Malachi. Is it safe to unplug this? Ah. Now I can see you. You don't have a black fuzzy right between my eyes. So, Malachi. I started this message the last time I was here with you, and, um, but I would like to take a little more time with the setting. Um, I don't think it'll be a real long time, but I'd like to give us the setting of uh, the book of Malachi and then get to, the, to the, the second half of the message. The setting is going to come to us from chapter 1. So we'll, be, we'll read through chapter 1 and then through our text, which is chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. And as we go along, I will try to help us get an understanding of what life was like in Israel when Malachi, when God sent his message to his people through his messenger, Malachi. So, in the beginning of the book, it says, The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi, I have loved you, saith the Lord, yet ye say, Wherein hast thou loved us? And they continued to complain. So the people of Israel had this big question to God. And basically, uh, this question or this accusation against God was, God doesn't love us. He doesn't love us anymore. He doesn't really care about us. See, they had come back from captivity. We are all, we're all Hebrew history scholars, right? We've studied it. We know, we know the story. Remember Daniel? went to Babylon, and then more went. They were scattered across the known world. And then Cyrus um, said they could go back. Ezra leads some back. Zerubbabel leads some back. Nehemiah goes back and builds the wall. Okay? If we remember little things about the things. I think it's in Ezra where uh, they, they finally finished the, 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 the temple. They had rebuilt the temple Uh, Nebuchadnezzar's armies had demolished it, flattened it, and they rebuilt it. And it was a day of joy and mourning. Same day. They were so happy, and yet many were there that had seen the previous temple, and this temple was not to be compared. And the previous temple was so glorious, it was, in one way, somewhat of a representation of their God. I'm not saying they worshipped their temple, but they had this glorious temple because they had a glorious God. And now God let them come back. He let them rebuild the temple, but it didn't look anything like it did before. And they had a, they had a city, and they had walls around their city, so they were kind of protected, but there was no king inside their city. They didn't have a kingdom. They didn't have a country, really. They just were able to live there. Things weren't that great. There's no... They, they, God doesn't really care about us. That was what they thought. They might not have said it that way, but God said (laughs) that they said, how do you love us? That's the way God heard their actions, heard the things that they said, the way they talked to one another, the uh, the, the way they offered sacrifices. How does he love us? How can we tell he loves us? Look at all these other things happening to us. Was not Esau... uh, So God answers them and says, Was not Esau Jacob's brother? Saith the Lord, yet I loved Jacob. And I hated Esau, and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Whereas Edom says, We are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, They shall build, but I will throw down. And they shall call them the border of wickedness, and the people against whom the Lord has indignation forever. And your eyes shall see, and ye shall say, The Lord will be magnified from the border of Israel. So God has to tell the people of Israel first, or remind them, that he loves them. That he loved them from the beginning. That he loved them before they were even a people. Right? Esau, you know, I chose Jacob. He loved them. And then... He begins to ask them some other things. And this this verses 6 through uh, the rest of the chapter kind of gives us, in God's um, 
interaction or discourse or interrogation of his people, we, we understand some of the things that they were doing. He says in verse 6, A son honors his father, and a servant his master. If then I be a father, where is my honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear? So what's God saying? You call me your father. You say you serve me, but you don't fear me. And you don't give me any honor. So, and that comes from this, this idea that God doesn't, love, God doesn't care about us. So he's, the people were like, God doesn't care about us in a couple ways. He doesn't care for us, but he really doesn't even care what we do. He doesn't care what we do, so it doesn't matter whether I give him fear, whether I fear him, because he doesn't care. It doesn't matter whether I give him honor, because he doesn't care. So he said, God says, if I'm a father, where's my honor? If I'm a master, where's my fear? Sayeth the Lord of hosts unto you, O priests, that despise my name. And ye say, wherein have we despised thy name? So God says to the priests, you're the ones that, have, that are the, the, the reason for this. You've despised my name. And they're like, what do you mean? We, we're, we work in your temple. How have we despised your name? We, we serve here every day. Okay, I'm putting words in their mouths. But as you read the text and you, uh, fill in, they're, they're like, how have we despised you? And, he, and God says, in that, right, ye offer polluted bread upon my altar. And you say, wherein have we polluted thee? In that you say, the table of the Lord is contemptible. Now, they're, they're going to say, we don't say the table of the Lord is contemptible. But see, here's the thing. What God thinks about something, we must think the same about it. Right? God put his table at a certain level. And the people were like, the priests, and the people where God doesn't care. It doesn't matter. I can do this, and he'll think it's okay. We put up our own, our own guidelines of what is acceptable to God. And that's what the people were doing. They were in a hard situation. They weren't the mighty, prosperous kingdom that they were before. They weren't rich. They, weren't, they didn't have all kinds of blessings. And so they said, well, under these circumstances, God can accept this. And he said, that's... That is having contempt for my worship. And, and they said, well, how are we contemptible? How are we doing this? And he says, and if you offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And if you offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? So they didn't have a lot of crops. Maybe they only had three sheep. One of them was blind, and they didn't want... They didn't want the next generation of sheep. I can't think of the right word. They didn't want their sheep to have little lambs and one of them be blind so they could just offer that blind one to God and keep the good sheep. God will understand. I only have three sheep. How am I going to live if, I, if, I, if, if my sheep are all sickly? Okay, now we're, we're, we're reading about people in the Bible so we can understand why it's wrong for them to think that way. But we justify ourselves. We say, God put me in this situation and so I don't have to measure up to what the Bible says. I can find some other Bible verse. I can say, I can do this, I can do this, and I can offer this. And that's what the people of Israel were doing at this time. This is why there's this conversation that God gives us between him and his people. And that's interesting. He says, offer it now under thy governor. You know, will he be pleased with thee or accept thy person, saith the Lord of hosts? So God says, you know, you, you take that sick lamb, give it to your governor. Will he say, oh, you really respect me a lot. No. But what's he say? what is God saying to them? But you offer that to me. And he's going to say, I'm greater than your governor. So, 
then says, uh, And now I pray you, beseech God that he will be gracious unto us. This has been by your means. Will he regard your person, saith the Lord of hosts? So he's, um, who is there even among you that would shut the doors for naught? Okay, so now he's still, this phrase in, is specific to the priests. He says, who is, who is there among you that would shut the doors for naught? What does shut the doors for naught mean? Well, what is not? Nothing. Okay. So, um, and then, and who will, the, might as well get the next phrase, who's there that will shut the doors for naught? Neither do ye kindle fire upon mine altar for naught. Okay. So a priest had jobs. You know, we think of them as this high and, you know, offering incense all the time. Well, there was more to it than that. Somebody had to open the door to the temple and close the door. Pretty simple job. Maybe they were big doors and it took a little bit of effort. Somebody had to light the fire. Some of you guys use wood-burning stoves in your house, right? It takes work, doesn't it? You've got to get the wood. You've got to chop the wood. You know, what, what somebody said, there's three heats out of a wood-burning stove. One is when you cut the wood down, you get warm. And, what's the, and one is when you carry the wood in, you get warm. And one is when you carry the ashes out. <laughs> so there's plenty of warmth that comes from a wood-burning stove. Anyway, uh, but the, the, the priest had to light the fire. All this, just this menial work, just work. And you guys won't even do it unless you get paid. What's your job? It's, that's your job to do that. You want a tip or something like that. Okay? Now, here's what was happening it, it's a vicious circle. Okay? The priest let people think that God, that God didn't really care. Right? So the people thought, God doesn't really care. So the people brought to the temple as sacrifices things that they didn't care about. They didn't offer him good worship. In that economy, what did they worship with? Animals. Grain. Who lived off of the offerings of the, temp of the temple? The priest. So the priests were saying, God doesn't care, it's okay. And then what were they getting? trash, and they felt like they needed a tip just to open the door. It just, it works, it just goes, you know, God's system works. You know, there's something about that. He just knows how people are, and he knows the way things should go. We just do it his way, it works out. But the priests were like, oh, it's okay. It's okay, you don't have to worship God that way. You don't have to give him that much. And then, then, they're, then they're going home and thinking, wow, there's not much food on the table. Well, duh. You just told the people God doesn't want much food. And yet God, you get fed from what the people give to God. Anyway, a little sarcasm coming out there. So, but, so they, wouldn't even, they wouldn't work. And God says, I have no pleasure in you, saith the Lord of hosts, neither will I accept an offering at your hand. For from the rising of the sun, even unto the going down of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles, and in every place incense shall be offered unto my name, and a pure offering, for my name shall be great among the heathen, saith the Lord of hosts. God is a great God. Regardless of whether we serve him as a great God or not, he is a great God. And he will get the worship that he deserves. And that's what he's saying here. Who's he saying this to? He's saying this to the people of Israel, and he's saying, I'm a great God, and I will be worshipped as a great God by the Gentiles. I thought, you, I thought we were your people. You're not worshiping me like I'm a great God. I will be worshipped as a great God by the Gentiles. And incense will be offered to me from the heathen. So there's this situation where there are people, basically, what, what, what might we say? People are going through the motions. They have a temple. They're going through the motions. They're doing it, but life is hard. So they excuse mediocre service. They excuse mediocre sacrifice. And God says, I'm not a mediocre God. And then he lays the blame for it. Now this is, the priests were mentioned in the first chapter there, and they are part of the problem. But who brings the offerings? The people, 
Okay, so the people are bringing these offers. This is the thought process of the people. And then in chapter 2, he actually lays the blame right at the feet of the priest. So, and now, O ye priests, this commandment is for you. If ye will not hear, and if ye will not lay it to heart, to give glory unto my name. So God expected them what? To give glory to his name. Saith the Lord of hosts, I will even send a curse upon you and will curse your blessings. Yea, I have cursed them already because ye do not lay it to heart. Behold, I will corrupt your seed. So this would be the offerings. The seed would be the people brought meat offerings or meal offerings. They'd bring all their grains. That's the seed. They're supposed to be able to get that seed and live off of that. And God says, I'm going to corrupt that seed. You're going to put it in the ground and it's not going to bring forth fruit. So, I will corrupt your seed and spread dung upon your faces, even the dung of your solemn feast. And one shall take you away with it. And ye shall know that I have sent this commandment unto you, that my covenant might be with Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. My covenant was with him of life and peace, and I gave them to him for the fear with wherewith he feared me and was afraid before my name. The law of truth was in his mouth, and iniquity was not found in his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity, and did turn many away from iniquity. For the priest's lips should keep knowledge, and they should seek the law at his mouth. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But ye are departed out of the way. Ye have caused many to stumble at the law. Ye have corrupted the covenant of Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore have I also made you contemptible and base before all the people, according as ye have not kept my ways, but have been partial in the law. So I'm going to get into this, but I just, that last phrase. So the people, the, the priest, in the circumstances, tried to make God, tried, they lowered the view of God to, in the people's mind. They said, oh, it's okay. Okay, it's okay. You don't have to do that. You don't have to do that. You don't have to do that. And what happened? They, they, many times we do this. We, we are like, I'm the servant of the Lord. We might not say it that way, but I'm the servant of the Lord. But, you know, somebody says, well, does God expect this? Let's just put something out there. And um, we say, well, yeah, but... Okay. We're tempted to do that. We might think it ourselves because we don't want to feel, we don't want to, we want this person to, to do it. We want this person to, we, we say, well, if, if I tell them what God really expects, they'll never do it. So I'm going to make it less. That way they will do it. Okay. And, they'll, they'll, and then they'll, they'll listen to me. They'll like me, we might say. Maybe it's not like. Okay. But what happened? That's what the priest did. They said, oh, it's okay. You don't, have to, you don't have to bring a perfect sacrifice. You can, we don't have to change the, the bread on the table every day. We can put stuff there. Or we can bring bread that's been used somewhere else and just put it there, profane the table of the Lord. We can, we can, just, we can do whatever. It, it'll work out. And after a while, what happened? Those, those men who did that so that, why do we do those things? So that the people would receive us, they became contemptible in the eyes of the people. And this is what we have in religion today. We have American religion that's trying to appeal to sensual mankind and because we want, we want them to worship, we want them to do this, and we make ourselves irrelevant because we don't represent a big God. And yet God is a great God. So, God says this messenger to his messengers. He says, and here, he's talking to priests, but you get that in verse 7, um, he, for the priest's lips, should keep knowledge, and they should seek the law at his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. Every one of us is a messenger of the Lord of hosts, to many different degrees, okay, and to different audiences, but we all bring the message of the Lord of hosts, and so we ought to be this person. We should keep knowledge, and people should seek the law at our mouth. When people hear from us, they ought to hear God's word because God has made us one of his messengers. And if you're here in this room, one of our primary goals is to equip you to be 
the messenger of God, to be God's messenger. So, we have a few points here, some things we can find from the, it, we see in these nine verses about God's message to the messengers. The first is the example. We mentioned this the last time. In verses 5 and 6, we see the example of Levi. We see, we see why the priest became priest, and it's because, the, 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 because of Phineas, because of Levi, because Levi... The office was given because he feared, because of the fear that he feared God with. Because he feared God with a certain fear, he, God made priests out of the family of Levi. Because truth was in him, and iniquity was not in him. Because he presented the truth. All the truth was given. None of the truth was withheld. And then, because he walked the talk. He walked the talk. The law of truth was in his mouth, and iniquity was not found in his lips. He walked. He walked with me in peace and equity, and did turn many from iniquity. So, God, God gave the office of messenger to the priest because of this fear of him, because of his love for the truth and his willingness to, to speak all the truth and not hide any of the truth, because he walked the walk, and because by his life he turned many to righteousness and away from iniquity. So that was the example. And then we have God's expectation. So the example is Levi. God's expectation is in a couple different verses, but the first expectation is that they would give glory to God. Verse one, or verse two. If ye will not hear, and if you will not lay it to heart, to give glory unto my name. There's tremendous temptation for anybody who stands in this position, myself included, to seek glory for ourselves. There's tremendous opportunity, and whether it's this position or some room, some spot in the front of a room with with other people listening, we. There's, there's, there's temptation and opportunity to pride, to self-will, to self-dependence. And yet, our first duty is to give glory to God. Our first duty is to give glory to God. And then, he expects us to keep knowledge. For the priest, uh, verse, is that verse 7? Um, For the priest's lips should keep knowledge. Now, you have to have it in order to keep it. You do. You have to have it in order to keep it. And you must keep it in order to give it. And you must practice with it in order to have it handy to be able to give it. So God expects us to give glory to him. He expects us to have and keep knowledge. He expects people to seek God from us. People should seek God from the messenger. It has to be God's word. You are all students, but many of you hope someday to be in a position where people will look to you for the word of God, for God's message for them. Make sure it's God's message. It has to be God's word. As much as we try in this school to help you understand how things work practically, how to work for the Lord, we can't skip over that it's God's message. If all you do is get up and encourage people to do a certain thing, to act a certain way, and it's not because God said to do it, even if it is the things that God said to do, are you catching my drift? You, that, is, that does not help people. People want to hear from God. They don't want to hear from you. They don't want to hear what they should do. Maybe they do want to hear what they should do, but they want to do it, or they ought to hear that they should do it because God said to do it, not because our church believes this, not because all Christianity has always believed this, not because we'll get good results, not because people will come, more people will come to church. All of those things are, are nice to see, but people need to hear God's word from your voice, from your, from your they seek 
the law at your mouth. And then it says, for he is the messenger of the Lord. God expects you to be his messenger. And we gave this illustration the last time. The messenger has no right to change the message. All he has is he takes it and he delivers it. He just takes it and he delivers it. You take the message and you say, wow, that's pretty harsh. I think I'm going to adjust that a little bit because I know who I'm giving this to and they're not going to like that. Or take it and say, man, that's kind of easy on them. I think, I, think, I think we should be stricter. And there are people that think you should be stricter than God expects. It's called legalism. We don't have a right to mess with the message. We are just the messenger. That's all. Just the messenger. So that's what God expects. God expects us to give him glory, to have and keep knowledge. He expects, us to, he expects people to come to us to know what his word is and expects us to deliver his message to them. And now we see God's evaluation. God's evaluation. They had departed to their own way. He says, and now, um, if you, uh, let's see here, where's that one? Um, okay, so, but, verse 8. So he, he's, you're the messenger of the Lord of hosts, but ye are departed out of the way. They, God had a way for them, and they left that way. Where do you go if you leave God's way? Your own way. They did it their own way. They thought, they thought their ideas about ministry, their ideas about what people want, their ideas about what God expected were more important and were really real compared to what God wanted. They went their own way. And when we go our own way, that is self-promotion. That is self-promotion. That is religions are going their own way. Religion, understand what I mean when I say that? Religion has this way. You do this, you do this, you do this, right? You do this, you do this, you do this. Okay? Self-righteousness, self-promotion. We have that in our own circles. We're tempted to it. Why are we tempted to do that? Because we're man. We can't, there's this one man way back who went his own way. Okay? He didn't have a bent towards sin in him, but he decided to do his own thing. God said, eat this fruit and you'll die. And he said, well, I think I'll become a god. And so he ate his fruit. And now that bent towards sin is in us. And so the bend towards self-righteousness, self-promotion, doing my own thing is within all of us, and we have to fight it. Hopefully we never get into you know, building our own system of self-promotion, but even independent Baptists, churches, lots of churches, have pastors at the head of them that are full of self-promoting. Their preaching is not biblical. It's not from the Bible. It's, it's a religion. It's do this. It's follow me. I did this. I did this. You do this. Rah, rah, rah. It's excitement. It feels good because it's about self. It's about the self of the preacher and the self of the people. And God is not pleased with that. He says, you've gone your own way. You're not promoting God. You've departed out of the way, and you've caused many to stumble. So when you do that, you cause many to stumble at the law. What we say should be life to people. And yet, it becomes death. If I take the gospel message, and I water it down so that it's more acceptable... The gospel should be life to people. But if I simplify it into, you know, if you, if you just do these things, you can have eternal life. And that person does those things. And they feel that they have eternal life. Someday they, they hear what they really, what they really have to believe, that they need to believe on Jesus and know who he is and, and surrender to him to, to have eternal life. And they say, well, I'm doing okay. I, did, I remember I did those things and I'm saved, they're going to end up in hell.
we, we do things, and that's the extreme example, but we in our ministry had the opportunity to water the message down so that people will like it. We think we're helping them, and yet we're causing them to stumble. The word should have been life, and it is death, and it's the preacher's fault. The person will die and go to hell, but his blood, right, will be on our hands. Some men, some messenger's word itself is a stumbling stone. We say something, and it's, and it's our word. People sit there and say, you know, that sounds right, but I need more than his word on it. What does God say about it? And they stumble at what they should do. If they just did what you said, they would be doing the right thing. Why would they be doing it, though? Because you said it. God's messenger has to give God's message. If it's your message, if it's your word, people will stumble at it. Either, either they do quote what is right for the wrong reason, or they won't do it because they know that they should be following God and not you, and you haven't explained to them what God wants. You just said what you think they should do. And God said that their, the priests um, had been partial in the law. What is partiality? I can imagine. The priest is standing there, and, some, and, and a rich nobleman comes, and he says, okay, Yep, oh, you know, I think that lamb has a blemish. Somebody else comes along and says, oh, that's okay. I know you live, on the, you live on the bad side of town. At least you came. God's, God's rule, God's law, is not to be administered with partiality. Rich, poor, famous, infamous, not famous. God's law is not to be delivered with partiality. The word applies to all equally and in the same way. And so God's evaluation of them was not good. They, were, um, they had gone their own way, they had caused people to stumble, and they had applied his law in, in, a, in a partial way. And so then he announces what evil will come upon them. He says he's cursed them. He says, um, that's in the beginning... I will even send a curse upon you. I will send a curse upon you. I, I'm, that's scary. And I don't have anything else to say about it. I will even send a curse upon you and will curse your blessings. Yea, I've cursed them already. So the priest would bless people. The Lord bless thee and keep thee, you know, I don't know, different uh, there's actually a formula in Leviticus that they were supposed to give. Okay? But they were supposed to bless people, and they were blessing people. But God says, I've cursed your blessings. You think, but basically he's saying, you think you're blessing people, but you're cursing them. People are listening to you. People are doing what you say, and they're being cursed because you're not giving them my word, you're giving them your word. You're giving them my word partially. And so they're being cursed. You're, you claim to be blessing them. They're coming to you for a blessing, and what they're getting from you is a curse. They follow you, and they're cursed. They, I have cursed them already because you do not lay it to heart. I will corrupt your seed. I said this already. The meal offerings were part of what they lived off of. And God said he would corrupt their seed. And I will spread dung upon your faces. I don't know exactly what that means, but I think about um, what Paul said. Paul said he, would, he counted all those things, right? But dung. The things of this world. Okay? And I don't, this is, this is way before that, but, but, what I think, what I, the way I think, what, I, what I've thought about this, and I think it applies. I don't know that it's clearly what's being taught here. So it might be a little of my own word here. But, but Paul said, I'm, I'm going to take all that, I'm going to count it as dung. And these priests said, 
What was their lifestyle? They wanted all that. All the stuff that Paul said, I don't care about that. I pick, care about God. They said, these priests were like, you know what? God doesn't really care. I want this. And God says, I'm going to spread all that on your face. People are going to see you for who you are. You claim that you represent me, and people are going to know you're in it for the money. You're in it for the goods. You're in it for the easy lifestyle. You're in it for this, and you're going to be carried away with that. Just take you away. So, I don't know if that's exactly what that means, but that's a good application for me. It reminds me where my focus ought to be. And then finally, he says, you will or have become contemptible and base. Oops. Um. Therefore, verse 9, Therefore have I also made you contemptible and base before all the people, according as ye have not kept my ways, but have been partial in the law. So it's not something that we seek after, but God elevates his man. God elevates his messenger. God puts him in a place of honor because he's the messenger of the great God. But when we do our own thing, God makes sure he, that you, we get we become contemptible. People look at us and say, I don't want that. People look at us and they say, he's just a money grubber. Or whatever. And the basest things are associated with men who claim to be messengers of God and are not. Men that hold the office of the messenger of God and are given their own message. God says, I'll make you contemptible and base. So, what do we learn from this? All of us, men especially, but even ladies, you have opportunities to preach, to preach God's word, to preach the gospel to people. This is an awesome responsibility. It is a heavy responsibility. It, is, it has both positive and negative consequences. Uh, we do that responsibility, and people are blessed. People's lives are changed. We do not fulfill that responsibility, and people's lives are not changed. They're cursed, and we are cursed. It is and ought to be a fearful position. We don't just stand up here or stand up somewhere, open God's word, and do whatever we think we can, whatever we want to with it. We have to be ruled by God's word. God's word rules what we say. We speak from God's word, not what we think about it. We speak from this. It's a fearful position. God holds it in much higher regard than many people who stand behind pulpits. And it's a sacred calling. It's a special place. It's set apart. Every one of us are set apart. But the, as messengers of God's word, messengers of God, we're set apart. And he expects something from that set apart position. It's not something that is just, oh, anybody can do it. Now, every one of us is called to do it at different times, different places. But we can't look at it like, oh, anybody can do it. It's like, all of us have to do it, but whoa, that's an important job. And I better do it the right way because God has high expectations from me. And he will be evaluating it. And he'll judge the way I deliver his message. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I wanted with all my heart to give you honor and glory through this teaching and preaching from your word. I pray that people do not think about me, but that they think about your word but Lord, I also pray that your word has convicted them about how they handle your word, how they think about handling your word when they have opportunities, and that each of us would be drawn in line with what your word expects of us. I pray that you'd be glorified throughout our college, throughout our schools, throughout our church, because we are doing more faithfully, and in a better way, 
what you want from us when we speak your word. I pray this would be the, one of the results of this message this morning. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. You can stand.